I'd like to welcome you back to A Few Minutes With. Uh, it's been a bit of a hiatus for me. I've taken some time off to refresh, uh, focus on my own ministry and and preaching and work with my congregation and really just recharge. So I'm excited to be back and I'm especially excited that my first guest out of the gate today is Reverend Dr. Jay Augustine. Uh, Jay hey. is the senior pastor of St. Joseph AME Church in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, he's a published author, a uh, contributor to a number of law journals and law reviews. Uh, he's consulting fac faculty at Duke Divinity School, uh, visiting professor at North Carolina Central University Law School. Uh, when do you sleep? <laughs> Rarely, right? Rarely. <laughs> but thank you so much. You're very generous and very kind, and it's really a pleasure to be with you. Well, I'm honored to have you here. Uh, for those watching and listening, Jay and I actually met at the Festival of Homiletics in Minneapolis back in May. Uh, for those who don't know what that is, um, as I said in a sermon to my congregation when I got back every year, there are science fiction conventions like Dragon Con, uh, there are comic book collector conventions, Comic Con, uh, this is basically Preacher Con uh, for folks who are in the pulpit. So I was uh, delighted to have a chance to meet you there. And actually, you mentioned... Uh, that it was not only your first visit as a presenter, it was your first visit altogether. So I'm curious, what was it like to attend the festival uh, with the dual hats of being both just an observer and also somebody preaching and presenting? Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, it was really rejuvenating. We all have been through so much. The clergy members have been through so much over the last few years in particular, and not that the job is easy regardless, right? Uh, but it was really rejuvenating to be in a space with so many wonderful homileticians, so many wonderful preachers and proclaimers of God's word. Uh, so very rejuvenating from a spectator perspective to be able to absorb and take things in, but equally rejuvenating from a from a uh, presenter's perspective uh, mm -hmm. to receive the very positive feedback I did to be able to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, social justice matters and prophetic preaching, to be able to talk about my work, right? I've, I've written two books over the course of the last two years, uh, that certainly have been a labor of love, uh, but to talk about the social impact and the social import of both of those works on the community was very, very refreshing for me. So I walked away like you coming from preacher camp and just as happy as I can be. Well, you touched on it a little bit just now. For me, uh, with everything the preachers and clergy have gone through, uh, it was just so nice to be able to shut down and be one in the pews just to be refreshed and recharged and there's such a wide range of phenomenal preachers and lecturers and you just come away uh, I came away uh, with wanting to just how do I incorporate all this in the preaching and in fact when I got back my parish vestry said we expect not that your preaching is bad now but we expect to to see some changes so I think as as time progresses they may actually get their wish and and hopefully more of those things will will go in uh, you mentioned uh, the two books, and I've been excited to have you on to talk about your most recent book in particular, uh, When Prophets Preach, uh, which you talked about at the at the uh, festival and uh, a little bit just now about how it's basically a toolbox to give folks uh, who are preaching uh, the motivation, uh, the skills, and a little bit of the basis to preach prophetically uh, and to encourage congregations to preach, uh, take that preaching and get engaged uh, with prophetic action. Uh, it's certainly got an incredible number of blurbs on the dust jacket. I mean, it's a who's who, Michael Curry, Rebecca Messman, James Forbes, Otis Moss III. So there's a lot of outside reasons to read it. I've read it. Uh, I've gone through two highlighters, reading it and highlighting. So I can certainly recommend it myself. Uh, I'm curious, you talk about a lot of the events uh, since the 2020 election, uh, and in fact, some of the Black Lives, uh, uh, the incidents precipitating a, an increase in the activity of the Black Lives Matters movement. Um, in thinking about doing this book, do you think you would have been able to do it at this point without these precipitating factors? Uh, or do you think you would have done it at all if it hadn't happened this way? I think I think the book and the one that preceded it, uh, uh, the one we're talking about, obviously, when prophets preach leadership in the politics of the pulpit, a uh, publication of Fortress Press, um, uh, 2023. It as well as the one from the previous year, Call to Reconciliation: How the Church Can Model Justice, Diversity, and Inclusion 
published by Baker Academic in 2022, both in the books really dovetail with one another, almost like a uh, part one and part two, almost like reading the Gospel of Luke and then going into the book of Acts, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, I think the books, just like a sermon, should be responsive and informative with respect to the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things I highlight in When Prophets Preach is the, is the great admonition from Karl Barth, a German theologian, that the pastor should preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Yeah. Uh, now, that's really a multi-layered uh, kind of axiom, right? Uh, but, but, but for my purposes, the, the biblical text comes to life and is made applicable based on what's going on in the world. So the book obviously is not only responsive uh, to recent events, uh, in responding to much of the polarity and the divisions we've seen in America, but it also attempts to chart a chart a forward course, uh, 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 to, to chart a course of optimism in response to much of the despair uh, that we've seen over the course of the last few years. So um, I think it is a timely work. I'm the author, so watch the source. He's biased. But I think it's a timely <laughs> work, right, in that it really is responsive to the day and age in which we live. And, uh, and I also think that because the old saying is true, uh, uh, nothing changes or there's nothing new under the sun, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the paradigm that we're seeing now is certainly a paradigm we've seen time and time again in the past. And if we live long enough, we'll see the paradigm repeat itself in the future. So I think the lessons learned and the applicability, the headline examples may be different, but the, the plot is not going to change. So I think it's a timely work, and I'd like to think it's one that will sustain its, uh, its value uh, because of the application. Well, there's so much about it, and I'm going to touch on it as we go through our conversation, but there is a lot in there, even if you remove the sections that focus on the current issues, current events that uh, were basically the maelstrom into which you stepped to write these two books. Uh, I think so much in there is relevant down the road, even beyond the current time. So I'm personally, as a preacher, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, you, early on, you talk about the fact that the entire concept of prophetic preaching is rooted basically in the very first sermon Jesus gave when he started his ministry. But even with that connection, that strong connection that you make, there seems to be a reluctance, I guess, or uh, you're not seeing enough of prophetic preaching. And I, I can speak for myself, I don't do enough of it. Uh, so this speaks to me just as much as it does anybody else. But with that strong biblical tie, why is it that there's still, in your experience, this reluctance to to get up and to be bold and prophetic from the pulpit? Yeah, thank you. And a great, great question. And I appreciate your, your own willingness to be vulnerable. Um, so I think the example of Jesus is preaching from Luke 4, mm -hmm. um, uh, his first, his inaugural sermon, if you will, right? He's reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. I think that is a great pinnacle for us in Christianity because as Christians, we're supposed to model ourselves after, after Jesus the Christ. Uh, but, the, but the image of prophetic preaching is one that really goes back to the 8th century prophets of old, uh, the, the willingness to, uh, to, to use the proverbial expression to speak truth to power, mm -hmm. or as I like to say, to oftentimes speak truth to institutions of power. Yeah. Uh, time and time again, when we look at Israel's history, uh, we saw corruption. We saw government moving in the in the wrong direction. We saw government forces marginalizing and pushing people to the periphery of society. Uh, it took prophetic leaders. Many of the prophets uh, who are quoted in the in the Old Testament stood tall with a willingness to do that. Jesus does much of the same, uh, but Jesus does it in a revolutionary way. Um, uh, he comes to usher in salvation, not just with a focus on the kingdom to come. Uh, but really to address social inequities and social disparities in the kingdom at hand. So that's why I begin with the focus there on uh, on Jesus's inaugural sermon. Um, in looking at, I think, individual reticence, however, to um, to address prophetic matters. First, if I can, if I can contextualize, uh, uh, some some scholars say prophetic preaching is the kind of preaching that will get a pastor into trouble or can get a pastor into trouble. Right. If it is a willingness to speak truth to power, it's got to also be a willingness to deal with the repercussions of one if, of what one speaks, deal with the repercussions of what one says. Um, as long as you are happy to be a bump on a log and go along with the status quo, you'll never cause any waves, you'll never cause any ripples, no one will ever get upset with you. Mm -hmm. But the minute you step forward, in the image of the Old Testament prophets, 
in the ministry in the in the image rather of Jesus the Christ with a willingness to speak truth to institutions of power to hold their feet to the fire to engage in civil disobedience uh to try to break up the status quo that is prophetic preaching which goes hand in hand with prophetic leadership something that is very important for me uh in the introductory to baseline portion uh, of the book mm -hmm. uh so so many ministers will be reluctant or reticent to engage in that sort of uh that sort of preaching uh because they may fear the the repercussion from the congregation um it's a it's a balancing act i recognize that i understand the the economic necessity of uh of 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 what a job means and at the end of the day yes we are called to do the lord's work but we live in this world uh so i, I totally understand that um uh, but for me uh many people are fearful uh because of congregational repercussion uh, my my good friend uh, Robert W. Lee, who is a who is a collateral descendant of Robert E. Lee, uh, began prophetic preaching in a congregation he was serving shortly after the uh, the Charleston massacre of the Emanuel Nine. Uh, began preaching about social justice and undoing white supremacy in the United States, and he was asked to leave his pulpit. So I certainly understand some of the economic fears there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the same God who provided in the past is the same God who's going to provide now and who will continue to provide in the future. Robert W. Lee is doing quite well, and uh, and I praise God for his his heroism, his willingness to to step forward and to speak truth to institutions of power. Do you think part of the issue is, uh, and you talked about this in your lecture in Minneapolis, and then you talk about it in the book as well? Uh, there's a very stark distinction between speaking politically uh, and speaking as a partisan, uh, from wherever mm -hmm. you fall on the spectrum. Do you think part of that is? Folks just don't understand uh, the difference. Uh, not only people in the pulpits, but uh, even uh, people stepping into the pul or, uh, people in the pews, but also people stepping into the pulpits. Do they not understand the distinction? And I guess as part of that, are seminaries not doing enough to prepare people to do this type of preaching and equip them with the knowledge of that distinction between the two? Yeah, it is a huge distinction. I want to. I want to, on that note, I'm a, I'm a very proud graduate of Duke Divinity School. Where I earned my doctorate. I serve on the Board of Visitors there. I've had the pleasure, as you made reference in the introduction of teaching there. I, uh, I really think it is a model institution in terms of information sharing and preparing ministers for advocacy, to share the good news of Jesus. But as you're sharing it, what does that mean? What does that compel us to do? What sort of faithful witness does that mean? So uh, Duke is a place, certainly among other institutions. I'm just obviously biased because I'm a graduate there. Oh yeah. But 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 institutions, I think, uh, do do ministers or do seminary candidates uh, a disservice when they do not focus on the role of church in society, not just church in isolation. Again, not just salvation in the kingdom to come, uh, uh, but to but the need to address social inequities in the kingdom at hand. And part of that is certainly tied directly to the difference between politics and partisanship. And just very briefly to highlight that, uh, uh, politics is a word that enters our English lexicon uh, uh, coming from the Greek, which means the polis or police, it's affairs of the cities. Mm -hmm. It deals with the allocation of resources. It deals with simple issues of fairness and equity. Much different from partisanship, but we talk deliberately about wearing red or blue or, or, or R or D. Uh, uh, so, so to be political is to address issues of fairness and equity, to talk about America's need for immigration reform, to talk about separating migrant children from their families at the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, to talk about the disparities we have with respect to uh, access to health care. Those are political issues because they deal with fairness, they deal with equity, they deal with community as a whole, but none of them are necessarily partisan issues. Although I do get the fact that partisans have staked out a particular place of advocacy on, on which, which, depending upon which side of the issue they stand. But those are the sort of issues that the church really should get behind. And the church as a body of believers will not get behind something unless the pastor or unless the preacher is advocated for it or advocating for it rather. And that is part and parcel of prophetic preaching. And you triggered something just now when you were talking about that. You cite the work of Eric McDaniel. Uh, talking about uh, the four steps, basically, of going from step one of prophetic preaching into uh, step four, which is congregational involvement in the community, trying to change the world. Uh, 
I think a lot of folks have difficulty. Well, step one takes courage, getting up in the pulpit and even yes. being prophetic preaching or preaching prophetically. But then step two, that getting the, the church has to be ready. The congregation has to be willing to hear what's being spoken uh, and then to engage with that inspiration that they're getting from the pulpit. What should a preacher do if they have the fire, they have the willingness to get up and to preach prophetically, but it's falling on deaf ears in a congregation that has zero interest in going into the world? Uh, a friend of mine said once that a problem we have in the church is uh, comfortable people sitting in comfortable pews that just want to have comfort preached to them. Yeah. Uh, what's what what's a preacher to do when step one is as far as you can get into the the four step process that McDaniel talks about? Um, what a great question. I think number one, um, uh, there's got to be a resiliency on the part of the preacher. Uh, not not all. You know, you you'd like to think once you're married that it's a good fit. We're here and we're going to stay together. Yeah. But oftentimes before getting married, we may date multiple people. <laughs> so so not not all not all uh, a pastor parishioner relationships or marriage material. Sometimes this is this works for the time. So the, the old expression is I'm looking for Mr. Right. Some people are looking for Mr. Right now. Right. So so sometimes the pastor parishioner relationships are one of convenience for a season, uh, but they may not be long term. I'm sharing that to encourage pastors uh, the church I'm blessed to serve now, St. Joseph AME Church in Durham, is the is the fourth congregation I've served. I pastored three other churches in Louisiana, progressive appointments or progressive uh, promotions, if you will, uh, through our system of itineracy. And I'm in a, I'm in a good space now. I'm in a good space uh, because the ideology of the of the pastor matches the ideology of the congregation, mm -hmm. uh, the concerns of the pastor. Of taking church beyond the four walls uh, uh, that uh, that 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 are a very comfortable space to your point, a very comfortable space, but of taking church in the true sense of the ecclesia or ecclesia, the body of believers, the church has got to leave the construct of the building, and the church has got to be in the community. So, so I'm in a I'm very fortunate now to be in a place where you you can sort of get married, you can focus on long term sustainment and long term changing the world. Uh, uh, because because you have shared values. To your point, though, about Eric McDaniel's uh, outline, the criterion that he lists uh, for when a congregation becomes political, the first step is it's got to be the pastor with a willingness to put his or herself out there, if you will, uh, and to lead in a political way. That's part of prophetic leadership. Uh, the pastor will know if they can do that based on, you know, it's a feeling, you know, you you, you kind of sense your congregation just like preaching. You may preach the same text in one way and may use different contextualized examples in one setting with a congregation and then with another congregation, the same text, but you may use different contextualizations to make it applicable in another setting. Mm -hmm. Different people, different different ways of making the text applicable. Uh, uh, so you know, what I'm saying is that's part of knowing your audience and knowing the congregation. When the, when the pastor knows this is a good place to, to you know strike and run, uh, uh, they should. But it, it takes a willingness reciprocally on the part of the congregation to receive what the pastor is offering and a desire to share it in order to help change the world. So um, so that is a, is an important part of discernment for those who are, again, not in a space where I have a have the sort of comfort uh, of the congregation with the congregation I share. Um, uh, I get it because I've been there before. I absolutely get it. And, and, and you have to be resilient. You have to recognize that. God, you know, the, the the part, the piece from Romans that Paul writes, um, uh, how can they hear without a preacher, right? They, how mm -hmm. can they hear without someone to proclaim? Uh, someone has got to try to, to open hearts, to open minds, and to change perspectives, and to take the context of church from the insular to the global, because we were sent to be disciples to the world. That's what Jesus Christ sent us, to the world, not just to our insular, uh, uh, comfortable pews. So um, it takes resilience. It takes patience. It also takes a realization of knowing that, you know, sometimes you date before you get married. And that's part of that's really part of, of, of pastoring and part of leadership. Do you think preaching through action is something that could be done? I know a lot of clergy uh, that may have been uncomfortable preaching uh, during the, the Black Lives Matters protest, preaching about what was going on uh, to uh, black brothers and sisters across the country. Um didn't want to preach in the pulpit, but would get out and participate in marches and and rallies and that sort of thing. Do you think there's value in preaching through action 
rather than just preaching from the pulpit. So it's not just words, but it's being visible about what you're what you believe in. There is an old expression uh, uh, where, where the observer says, I'd much rather see a sermon than hear a sermon any day. Right. So there certainly is something to be said for putting the the the, the egalitarianism, uh, uh, the love of all the beloved community of putting that into action and showing it and living it out. Uh, that that really, really says something. And it's it's something that arguably preempts uh, the spoken word. However, as a preacher, I will also say that there is no substitute for the spoken word, right. uh, because in our particularly in our Protestant traditions, where we put so much emphasis on preaching, regardless of whether it's black church, white church, regardless of whether it's Episcopalian, Baptist, whatever the case may be, the spoken word is 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 literally God moving our hearts, God moving our minds, and how God acts through a preacher who is prepared and who is willing to take risk. But how God moves through a preacher to to change hearts and minds, but to move those hearts and minds once they are changed. So I think the two that you reference, seeing the sermon or listening to the sermon, should not be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Instead, they hopefully should work hand in hand to help make the world a better place. And that 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 is the ministry we we contextually call reconciliation. That's what Jesus left to the church for us to to, to be reconciled to one another, uh, just as we are reconciled to God. I'm glad you mentioned reconciliation. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was uh, concerns I've heard about using the phrase reconciliation, because often I think people think to be reconciled, um, you have to have come from the same starting point. And I know in the broadest sense, we come from the same starting point as children of God, uh, brothers and sisters in the same family. But for those that have concern about reconciliation, because, you know, for instance, how can... Uh, member of the white community be reconciled to somebody from the black community that's faced completely different difficulties, vastly different life experiences. How can you be reconciled when you don't have that same starting point? Sure. Well, one of the things, and I mean, that's such an excellent point of reference, and I own that. I own that up front. In, in Call to Reconciliation, um, I outline, uh, uh, I, I own it right up to say that uh, uh, oftentimes there is the question of how can we reconcile black and white when we have not lived in a conciliatory space in the first place, right? We're not coming from a common point of origin. So that is fair. So I look at reconciliation in the broadest context as a journey, mm -hmm. much more so than a destination. Um, it's a it's a journey of trying to undo certain things that may have become systemic. Uh, in, on, on one side, when you presuppose the inequalities that have existed in America, when you contextualize inequalities uh, with race, that normally means black and white, that social construct of race. When you look at gender, it may mean male, female. It may mean any different uh, a number of examples, but it, but there certainly a, are some inherent imbalances uh, when you talk about reconciliation. On one side, it means a willingness to do things differently and not 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 maintain systems that are injurious to another. Mm -hmm. And on the part of the party that has been marginalized, it's a willingness to engage in forgiveness for the transgressions of the past and and and, and in many regards to 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 foster a space where differences can be achieved, where you can do some things differently. So there are reciprocal obligations, neither of which is for the faint at heart, that's for sure. But that is part of the ongoing journey of reconciliation opposed to a destination. Let me, think, let me brief, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I apologize. Go no, ahead. no, go I ahead. Um, I want to I wanna just briefly say in, in Call to Reconciliation, the previous work, I contextualize that word, recognizing it's troubled, uh, 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 I don't want to say it's troubled past, but the nuanced way in which it's often misunderstood today. Um, I contextualize it in a threefold manner. Uh, there is salvific reconciliation I write about. There is social reconciliation, and then there is civil reconciliation, which ties directly to prophetic leadership. Salvific reconciliation, if you can imagine the two planes of the cross, the vertical mm -hmm. and the horizontal, salvific reconciliation says that as we as humans, from a Christocentric perspective, are reconciled in our relationship with God through Jesus. Jesus suffered, Jesus died, Jesus rose again, but Jesus also lived. And the type of life Jesus lived, and looking at the horizontal axis there, horizontal plane, Jesus lived the life 
showing equality or, or embracing equality, showing egalitarianism and bringing people who were pushed to the margins and pushed to the social periphery, bringing them into the mainstay. So we are we are uh, 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 reconciled with God through Jesus, but we are equal to one another because of Jesus, right? So mm -hmm. with those two planes as an exemplar, uh, a civil reconciliation then is probably a close a close cousin, if not a sibling, of civil, excuse me, civil reconciliation is a close cousin, if not a sibling, of social reconciliation, because it is the ethic of clergy and concerned laity that move into politics, that move into prophetic leadership when they hold government's feet to the fire and live out. If we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people, I didn't say all men, that all people are created equal, then the prophetic leader will show civil reconciliation by engaging in civil disobedience, by, by speaking truth to power for governmental institutions that harm God's children, uh, by addressing those political matters, not partisan matters, but those political matters uh, that must be addressed as part of that ethical uh, uh, domain of who we are as, uh, 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 as, as siblings in Christ. So the three really go hand in hand, notwithstanding the troubled nature or the trouble and oftentimes misunderstood way in which reconciliation is used. I totally get the question, and uh, and I hope in some way that was responsive to it. It was, and as you were talking, I think one one example you cite of this uh, in the book is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa uh, in yes. the post-apartheid era. Would something like, and now obviously apartheid was a far different experience nationally for everyone there than I think in some respects what we've had here. Was it was it that different? Was it was it really? I'm, I'm not, much of truth is made in jest. I'm only yes. I'm listening to the question, but was it that different? And, when and, you think about the Jim Crow South, when you think about the atrocities of the antebellum South, right. I don't know that it was that different. But we can debate semantics on another time. You were about to ask a question. Well, Sorry. no, and that and I'm grateful for that because that's where I struggle with trying to draw and articulate uh, comparisons. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a question that I'll get to in a little bit, but I'm wondering if. Would that sort of commission work here? Uh, I know there there has to be a willingness for it because there's a willingness of people to engage in these conversations uh, and the work of reconciliation, uh, reparations being a part of that as well. And you talk about that. But do you think that type of commission would even have a chance here to get off the ground uh, and serve a, a function as it did in South Africa? There is a, a, a great... Uh, quote, quote, axiom, saying, however you want to phrase it, but I oftentimes will share with others. Uh, uh, we may oftentimes disagree, but we never have to be disagreeable. Mm -hmm. For me, that really means that if America truly is the greatest country, and oftentimes we hear that, particularly around the 4th of July and other, other patriotic themes, if America really is the greatest country, democracy has got to be lived out. That means a willingness to hear other ideas that are different from your own. And again, you may not always agree with those ideas, but after you thoughtfully digest them, you have an opportunity to voice your approval or disapproval in a in a respectful manner. That is the that is the greatest gift of democracy in our nation. So would a commission like that work? I think as long as we are able to listen to one another, listen to a discourse that may be different from something we're familiar with, and uh, and listen to it with an open mind, with an open eye, um, I think it will be very beneficial. Uh, as long as we do not resort to acts of violence and mm. resort to anarchy because we may disagree with something, I think a commission like that would be incredibly helpful. Um, I, I recently saw, I'm a, I'm a constitutional law professor as well, so I certainly understand the power that the vice president has and the limited power that the vice president has with respect to the certification of uh, uh, electoral votes mm -hmm. uh, for, for president and vice president. So I, um, I respect, more than I can put into words, I respect Mike Pence for the position he took for recognizing that his role was really ministerial. It was not one of advocacy. It was not one of discretion. It was really ministerial because once those votes were certified by the states, he was supposed to accept them. He did what he was supposed to do. But at the same time, people in our country were engaged in anarchy. They were engaged in an insurrection, mm -hmm. in a violent insurrection, in an attempt, quite frankly, to hang him. Now, I just want to stop for a moment and just paint that. Some 
through outside the de the doors of the United States Capitol, broke into the United States Capitol screaming, hang Mike Pence mm -hmm. to hang the vice president of the United States of America. When we resort to tactics like that, a commission will never be helpful. Nothing will be helpful. We're going to hell in a handbasket. But as long as we can maintain a democratic perspective and listen to one another and honestly try to learn from one another, I think a commission like that will be incredibly helpful. Yeah. One of the things that came to mind as you were talking uh, about reconciliation, prophetic preaching, all of these in, in combination uh, is the storytelling component of it. And as I told somebody one time, somebody can share their story with me. Uh, somebody can talk about what it was like to live that experience. I could never tell that story because sure. it's not really my, it's not my story to tell. I can say that somebody shared it, but it's not mine to tell. It's not mine to give. So as we're preaching prophetically, as we're doing the work of reconciliation, what should we do to guard against appropriation? You know, going from the telling and sharing of stories to almost possessing a story that's not our own in an effort to be a prophetic preacher, uh, engaged in civic life, engaged in the community. What, what safeguards can we take to inadvertently, or to prevent ourselves from inadvertently taking something that's not ours to take? Sure. So I, I think that number one, one of the pre preachers will all be different because individuals are different and preachers are people. Mm -hmm. uh, so so sermons are going to be different. Sermonic delivery is going to be different. But if there is ever a formula that I think most preachers follow, uh, uh, explanation, illustration, application. And illustration oftentimes comes from uh, the individual's lived experiences. Uh, that is the that is the authenticity of who the individual is that draws the listener in. And oftentimes, to your point, that is through the power of narrative. Oftentimes when I'm preaching, I'll stop and say, let me tell you a true story. How oftentimes have I talked about my mother? How oftentimes have I talked about something from my native New Orleans? How oftentimes do I reference something that is uniquely my experience because it draws people in to me as the preacher for that given moment? Mm -hmm. One of the associate ministers will preach something very different because it's based on their life experiences. A guest preacher will preach something different because it's based on their life experiences, too. I'm sharing that to say that all of us should feel empowered to share uniquely from who we are because each and every one of us has been called by God to do the good work of preaching God's liberating love to other people. Um, um, when you follow that, when you follow that illustration and you share of yourself, um, I think there is a willingness to receive it. And, and let me illustrate by, by um, a contrast of color, if you will. Mm -hmm. I am obviously an African-American pastor, preacher, prophetic leader, however you want to phrase. And I will oftentimes give those contextualized examples from my lived experiences as an African-American. And, and people can respect that. It will resonate with others, whether I'm preaching in a majority white congregation, whether I'm preaching to a majority black congregation, whether I'm preaching in a mixed congregation, because it's authentically who I am. Mm -hmm. I have had friends who are white preachers who have come to St. Joseph. I have had friends in other spaces, white preachers who've gone to other congregations I've served. And, uh, and when they share authentically from who they are, in the midst of a majority black crowd, they are received incredibly well because the power of narrative and the authenticity of who they are is what draws people in. Mm -hmm. So rather than appropriating someone else's story, I would I would suggest that uh, if I can say humbly, just like I know with conviction, the good Lord called me, just like I believe with conviction, the good Lord called you, just like I know with conviction, God called some women to ministry, God called men to ministry, God has called a proverbial other to ministry. God has given us all a unique story and part of drawing the listener in and preaching is sharing authentically your story. So there's no need to appropriate someone else's. Yeah. And does that make sense, I hope? It does make sense. And I, I, I wonder too about the concern some may have that they almost will pull back on their preaching because they're worried about inadvertently appropriating or inadvertently taking without even realizing or meaning to do it. Suddenly they've launched into a sermon and they realize in hindsight, I shared a story that's not mine. I shared an experience that's not mine. Uh, and, you know, I've, what we can do to safeguard 
rather with you know intentionally getting up and preaching and telling a story knowing that you're telling a story that's not yours but slipping in and doing it accidentally uh how do we you know prevent ourselves from from doing that but you addressed it really by saying you speak authentically from your own from your Absolutely. own experience and I, and I think people are drawn to that. And if I can just give, this is not a sermonic example, but it follows the same explanation, illustration, application on the note of illustration. I was with my father in the ministry over um, over the 4th of July break. And, um, and he said, you know, I read a book recently. I'm catching up on some books. And I thought about you. He said, this guy really told it like it is. He said, I forgot the name. White too long. I say, yeah, Robbie Jones. Absolutely. Robbie Jones, white too long. White guy from Mississippi and has called out white Christian nationalism in the, in the church, in American church, and saying that we have been white too long. We've been alienated too long. Absolutely so. And he relies on his own experiences as a white man from the South to identify a problem, to call out the problem, and to propose solutions to the problem. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I can't appropriate that story, right? Right. But he's spoken authentically as, as he is. He's being received incredibly well because of his authenticity. So everybody has a unique story, and I would encourage everybody who wants to move to the goal of eradicating racism, of doing away with misogyny, of addressing social issues that, that, that may make us uncomfortable from time to time, be like Robbie Jones and White Too Long. Authentically share who you are and, and, and authentically share yourself because it will be well received. Do you think authenticity, uh, going back to McDaniel's four steps, uh, the, the four steps and and prophetic preaching and action, in the first step where the preacher gets into the pulpit, do you think authenticity can help sway a congregation that might otherwise be reluctant to get engaged. Uh, you know, there's going to be congregations like, yeah, we hear it, let's go. But, uh, you know, do you think authenticity is helpful in swaying a congregation that either may be opposed or may be on the fence about, about getting engaged? So I think that authenticity depends on the pastor, right? Some, some, and I will, I will just, as a, as a, a, a line of, of demarcation, if you will, um, the, the book, let me back up. The book begins when prophets preach begins by laying out a, a, a leadership and what is prophetic leadership. And it does so in the context of the Munus triplex doctrine, or some call it the Munus triplex doctrine, where we study Christ as the perfect exemplar of leadership and categorize his three domains as prophet, priest, king or royal in non-gender specific terms, right? Mm -hmm. The work of the priest is different from the work of the prophet is different from the work of the royal. We're focusing on prophetic leadership. Clearly, we're talking about that. But the work of the priests is conciliatory leadership. It's the hospital visits. It is the it's the the burying the sick. Excuse me, burying the dead. It's it's marrying, uh, uh, bringing unions together with families. It's baptizing babies. All of those are aspects of priestly leadership. Uh, 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 the royal leadership gives direction to a congregation. Gives direction to people. It sets church budgets. It oftentimes says these are our goals for the upcoming year. Uh, and obviously we focused on on what what prophetic leadership is. So some ministers are really, really more priestly than prophetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some ministers are more royal than they are priestly, right? So going to authenticity, um, uh, if if being a prophet is really, really, really not who a minister is, it's going to show. It's going to absolutely <laughs> show. It always does, right? So we right. have to be true to who we are. Recognizing, however, that as I look at Jesus's ministry, he was complete in all three of those domains, prophet, priest, and royal. No human being, however, will be complete in all three of those domains. Mm -hmm. We inevitably will gravitate to one more so than the other, have a great deal of comfort in one, and probably a great deal of discomfort in the other. Um, uh, my, my attempt here is to say that the church cannot put its head in the sand with respect to the political issues, not partisan, but the political issues that are dividing our country. So if we are going to follow the complete example of Jesus, as you illustrated in the in the Luke 4 text that begins, uh, uh, Jesus has Jesus addressed social issues that were very divisive at his time. And he said as a subjected and a marginalized uh, 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 ethnic Jew in the Roman Empire, he shared, he's come to address these matters. It's a powerful, powerful read of Isaiah and a powerful proclamation from Jesus himself. I encourage all pastors 
you cannot put a head in the sand with respect to many of the social divisions that are going on in the United States of America. Fourth of July, as we were supposed to be celebrating America's independence, there were 17 mass shootings across the United States. The prophet has got to speak out. Those That is one of so many examples of how we are being torn apart as a people, and we cannot let domestic terrorists who who attempt to inflict fear upon people in the name of the second amendment or otherwise we cannot let those folks have the have the last say because there are legal means to address that legal means to remedy that how do we move legislators we move them through their constituents and through people and those are the people that are in our pews i'm just using that as one example to say to illustrate the importance of prophetic leadership which comes or goes hand in hand with prophetic preaching yeah thank you for that there is, I noticed as I was reading through the book, there's a word that came up a few times. And I think in normal circumstances, it wouldn't have jumped out at me, but the way you used it was so powerful, it was just leaping off the page at me. And it was the word invite. There were several instances where you talked about uh, an invitation to a congregation to do something, uh, an invitation to individuals to to take particular action or to engage. It wasn't so-and-so must do this. I'm demanding that so-and-so do this. It was invite. And in the midst of everything that you were addressing, the use of that word to me was really powerful because it was almost like an eye of a hurricane. You're going through the mm -hmm. swirl of everything that precipitates the need for prophetic preaching and civic engagement but it's doing it in a way where you're almost opening your arms and extending an invitation. So was I, I know it was an intentional thing, but uh, I just wanted to say how much that meant to me because there's a lot more power, I think, in invitation than in pleading or in urging or that type thing. Absolutely. So one of the, uh, one of the things I think that is, is very relevant about the book um, it, it, it begins in sort of a cerebral capacity. It gives some, you know, theoretical notions of leadership, prophet, priest, king, monas, triplex. It moves into some examples of how prophetic leadership stands up and stands out, looking at uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and dealing with the construct of race mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the American state. Uh, it also looks at Dietrich Bonhoeffer and looking at the construct of ethnicity between a, a Jew and, and German there. Uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the German state, right? Uh, but then toward the end of the book, the last chapter moves for a practical prescription for bringing people together. Going back to the term reconciliation, right? Not that they necessarily had a conciliatory relationship before, but trying to move on a journey opposed to a destination. And it extends an invitation, or it advises pastors to extend invitations to various groups. The other capital mm -hmm. O. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than being limited by the otherism of a of a replacement theory and a fear and saying that, you know, this segment of society is going to replace me or, you know, uh, uh, Jews are replacing us or African-Americans are replacing us. It invites pastors to go into a place of holistic acceptance of the humanity of all of us as parts of the beloved community uh, and use the church as a vessel to do that. I recommend a, a calendar. It certainly has worked well in my ministry. Uh, but a calendar that says, let's bring the sacred and the secular together to heal communities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, certainly the liturgical year begins with Advent, the Adventus and the anticipated coming of Christ. You move into uh, the Christmas uh, season, of course. But then in January, there's Martin Luther King Jr. Day. What an mm -hmm. opportunity to invite somebody who otherwise might not be in that space, invite them into the space. Again, with that same understanding that we talked about before. We may not always agree on everything, but we never have to be disagreeable. We can always find common ground. How about moving into February then with the celebration of Black History Month? Uh, well, somebody may say, well, we don't have any Black people in the church. Okay, would you invite some? Mm -hmm. Would you would you be willingness to, would you invite someone in your congregation to learn more by having a, a brief segment, a brief segment, a two-minute read during the course of the four Sundays in February, Profiles in Black History, to lift up somebody other than Martin Luther King Jr., lift up Frederick Douglass, lift up Thurgood Marshall, something about their background and how they overcame obstacles and circumstances, especially in a majority white church where people otherwise might not know about those folks, right? Mm -hmm. I like to move from, from February to March and use the example of how, of how women have sustained the church through the years. So for me, March is always a high celebratory time 
uh, even though it's in it's into the Lenten season generally, right? It's into the Lenten season. Uh, Sundays is supposed to be a cheat day away from the sacrifice. Sunday is supposed to be a celebratory day uh, uh, in the in the in the calendar. Um, uh, I focus on Women's History Month and celebrating the accomplishments of our sisters. I'm using that just illustratively to say of the 12 months throughout the year, I begin uh, uh, really with the last Sunday of November or first Sunday in December as Advent falls mm -hmm. and go all the way through the, the calendar year and liturgical year and bringing together a time of celebration, a time of lament, uh, a time of, of information sharing, all of those things that go on with ministry, with a healthy diet of ministry, if you will, um, uh, to invite others to Christ by being specific in inviting people to Christ. That for me is a is a fundamental part of what reconciliation is supposed to be. That chapter was a revelation to me. I'm very type A, I will freely admit that. <laughs> <laughs> so scheduling is a huge thing for me. But reading this chapter, I was pulled up short significantly because I realized my scheduling is done through basically blinders through tunnel it's tunnel vision mm -hmm. you know it's october so we've got the blessing of the animals or the trunk retreat uh it's august so we're going to collect the gift cards for the elementary schools uh it's lent so we're going to do the lenten series during the week but it was all within what i was used to um and i loved that chapter so much because it was like a window was opened in a part of the house that i'd never been in before and i'm seeing an entirely different way of engaging the church in the community and bringing the community back to the church. And that's something I have wanted to do with this church. It's actually the church I was raised in. So the, all these years mm. later, mm. I'm back mm. as the priest. And the church was always the center of the community historically uh, for the last. And that's almost. the way it should be. That's really the way it should be in every community. As far as I'm concerned, that's really the way it should be. Yeah. And so your, your chapter, and you're talking about that calendar, a, it stripped away the blinders. And I was, my field of vision became enormous, but it was also like, this is how we can get the community here. Even if they don't come on Sunday, if it's a Wednesday night thing, if it's a Saturday afternoon event, this is how we can get the community here. This is how we can build. Community. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and thank you for so much for saying that. I'm um, that, that is really my goal to make church, not just geographically the center of communities, but, but in terms of the emotion that it really should be the center of communities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things I also realized in a very practical uh, context when I was pastoring in New Orleans, I had the blessing of serving the oldest predominantly black Protestant church in the Deep South, a congregation that was founded in 1844. And the building that I worshiped in or let worship in was founded in 18, was established rather, was constructed in 1848. Needless to say, maintenance was a major line <laughs> item in the church's budget. Needless yes. to say. I had to be creative, and we were creative by having benefit jazz concerts in the church. One of the reasons for that is recognizing jazz in a place like New Orleans. Everybody loves jazz, right? But um, but that's not just to to serve or to to entertain, if you will, the congregation. It's really an invitation to the community to come to a place that perhaps you might otherwise not go. Mm -hmm. You may have no interest in going to church on Sunday. But, but jazz, if it's something that largely the community is in love with, is infatuated with, and some of the headline artists we had, I'm really working at re-imaging what church means, what church looks like to you. It's not just a place that's a one-day-a-week operation, but it's a place where you can go in so many regards for satisfaction, whether it be for a meal, uh, whether it be for spiritual satisfaction, a spiritual a sustainment, whether it be for community forms, for news, for pop, whatever the case may be. My goal is always in this day and age of, of postmodernism, it's called, right? right? In this day and age to re-image what church looks like for folks. And that was really my my attempt in offering a, a chapter five, the prescriptions there. So thank you so much for saying the way it touched you and maybe opened some perspectives in your ministry. Thank you so much. Oh, it, it's my pleasure. And I'm going to be going back to, like I said, uh, I've highlighted the fire out of this. Uh, I think I went through awesome. two. Uh, and I'll be going back to it often, but yeah, there's so much rich, rich material here. Um, I'm learning how much I don't know. Uh, this conversation that we've had, uh, I am thankful for your grace with me uh, as I struggle with my comprehension and how to relate and how to put language to things that are not my experience. Um, 
I'm not a prophetic preacher yet. We had this conversation in Minneapolis, not yet. Oh, sure. Uh, so I'm just grateful for this because, and you told me when I read, when I first bought it and you signed it, and we were chatting uh, that you hoped it would make an impact on me. And I don't think you'll ever know how much of an impact it made on me because again, it's, it's helping me put language to the things that I haven't been able to talk about. It's helping me prepare myself for the things that I think I need to do moving forward uh, and to have these conversations with members of my parish, uh, with clergy colleagues uh, in, in the, the diocese. Uh, so all I can say is thank you. It's been a revelation for me. And I'm just grateful that, you know, I'm sorry that we had all the circumstances in the nation and the world that precipitated your feeling the need to write this. But one of the gifts from that negativity and that the horrible events of January 6th and everything else is this book and the impact it's made on me. And I encourage everybody to get it because I have no doubt it'll make an impact on, on them as well. Thank you so much. I want to I wanna lift up something briefly because you just said something that is the perfect. If I were trying a case right now, I would say, Your Honor, Exhibit A. I mean, there we go, right? You just, you just made the entire case. Um, uh, the Supreme Court recently ruled uh, against affirmative action, a uh, uh, really, really undermining affirmative action in college and university admissions. Um, and it it undercut the value of diversity. Um, I want to I wanna take that legal opinion or that rationale, and I want to hopefully flip it on its ear by giving a scriptural contextualization, mm -hmm. as well as going, I think, to the heart of what you just said and what what underlies or or, um, uh, or under, under supports your comments. Um, um, number one, from a scriptural perspective, um, the the church begins uh, in a in a non reconciling sense. It begins as a as a Jewish entity uh, where Gentiles are seen separate and apart. Mm -hmm. uh, so 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 what would become the church? What what the the first the first time the word church is used in in scripture is in Matthew. Uh, what Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. And he says that to Peter and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That rock, as we know in the Protestant context, differing from our Catholic siblings in Christ, is not so much the physical body of Peter, but it's Peter's faith. It's Peter's faith to step out and do something differently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the church then starts to come to fruition in Acts 2, when you read the narrative there, Pentecost Sunday, right? Where Peter preaches and all these scores of folks join the church. But as you know from the narrative there, they're, they're Medes, they're Parthians, they're others, others, but all of them were Jewish. None mm -hmm. were Gentile. Mm -hmm. So meaning all of them were the same. If we were to put that in our own racialized context, that means, okay, all of these people, they may have been from different parts of the United States, but all of them were white. It was still a white church. All of these folks may have been from different parts of the United States, but all of them were black. They were still in the black church. But then you move into reconciliation in Acts 10. In Acts 10, when that same Peter has a divinely inspired vision from God. Uh, uh, get up, kill and eat. Mm -hmm. And this is this is my paraphrasing. This is the J. Augustine version, not the King James, and not the <laughs> this is the J. Augustine version. Get up and kill and eat. God, mm -hmm. I'm a devout Jew. I'm not that stuff is unclean. How can you mm -hmm. tell me to eat a pork chop? How can you tell me to eat a ham sand ha ham sandwich? God, I'm a devout Jew. Uh, that stuff is profane. And, and in Acts 10 34, after God tells him, How can you call profane that which I have made clean? 1034, Peter then says, aha, I realize God is no respecter of persons. That's the King James version, but meaning God does not show distinctions among us. We all are, we all have something in common here. We all are God's children. My point is Peter would not have come to that realization. It was a divinely inspired realization, but after Peter comes into contact with Cornelius, he's changed and he welcomes Cornelius and baptizes him as the first a Jew, excuse me, the first Gentile to come into the otherwise Jewish church. Going to to what you said, then hopefully I've looked at the Supreme Court. I've given a scriptural scriptural contextualization into what you said. I never would have thought about this. I never. Isn't it wonderful when you're in a laboratory with others, be it academic, be it religious, be it what have you? Well, when someone oh, yeah. shares from a life experience, and you can turn around and say. Never thought about it like that before. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate example of contextualized learning because you really are changed and prayerfully made better by someone else's perspective. That is really the value of what diversity in higher education and in academic settings is, 
because it allows us not just to read what the 14th Amendment says and to talk about equality under the law, but to understand that your experiences with the 14th Amendment and my experiences will be dramatically different. But if we can come to a space of sharing, we both can walk away by saying, I never thought about it that way before, or I have not seen that before. Mm -hmm. We both will learn from one another. And if that logic applies for the two of us, that logic should apply universally. So I Amen. just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you from the bottom of my heart for for, uh, uh, for 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 being able, being open enough to receive something that perhaps is different from where you've been in the past and your willingness to put it into your toolbox to use to bring other people or to invite others closer to Christ. So thank you so much. You have truly, truly, truly made my day. Thank you. And you've made mine by being here. Uh, in closing, uh, if folks want to follow uh, your ministry, your work as a, a teacher, a lawyer, preacher, uh, the 19 things I'm, that you're doing right now, uh, what's, the best, easy to find. <laughs> what's the best way easy folks to can find. follow you? Sure. On, on, on the World Wide Web, I am J Augustine, J-A-Y-A-U-G-U-S-T-I-N-E.com. On social media platforms, I'm at J Augustine, J A Y A U G U S T I N E nine, just the number nine. And I'm as easy to find or Google search. My given name is obviously Jonathan C. Augustine, but everybody calls me J, J A Y. So a Google search, I promise you, I'm easy to find. So thank you so much again. I appreciate the time with your listeners or your viewers. And it really is an honor to be with you. Thank you, Jay, so much for being here. God bless. God bless you too. Mm -hmm.